But uh, um, Tash, we had some just something on smell, so I'm gonna carry on with senses. Um, but I think it's the only one that I'm not in. I'm not taking into account yet. So, how is the current perception about how we interpreting our surroundings? So by the time that uh, Ingold came with the task uh, scapes idea, everybody understands everything as a place full of actions, full of activities, that they're shaping the past, really, and shaping the landscapes around us. But behind these task taskscapes, so behind we even start acting on the environment, we have, first of all, Phil, uh, we have, uh, in reality, gather all this information in order to actually starting uh, acting. And we do that with uh, senses, feelings, and emotions. We actually blend all together and create behaviors, decision makings that leads to actions. Mm -hmm. um, and these actions are the taskscapes that we archaeologists, we can record. I mean, they have traces. Uh, and there's a feeding situation. So there was all this discussion about 30 years ago started. Can we archaeologically approach any of these three things? So we can explain more um, behind, be, uh, we can explain a little bit more how these taskscapes are created. And finally, can we interpret or explain or describe these tasks as filling scapes? Right? It's that, that's the research question. Um, so after a gap in history, uh, senses are back in town finally. Uh, and we had post-2010 two very nice books. Um, one is the archaeology of the senses and the other is the archaeology and the senses. And there's a massive discussion between these of and this end. Uh, but both of these books, by uh, my compatriot Hamilakis and Robin Skitz, they're discussing exactly the same thing. How can archaeologically approach senses, feelings, behaviors, or I, all this stuff behind actions? Uh, and mainly Robin, but actually Hamilakis follows the same way of thinking. They're coming out with a step-by-step -step methodology to do that. Uh, everybody happy? Not so. Most of the people, they say, okay, we can do the reflexivity, the inventory, the experimentation, that's all right, but then thick description and creative writing? Seriously? So if you have a lovely couple and you dig them up, they're skeletons, not like this, uh, <laughs> and uh, how you can understand with, I mean, you can use creative writing, but really, can you talk about them? Um, and there's a very nice piece of paper by uh, Ruth Tringham actually discussing uh, Hamilaki's book. Like, I love your ideas, but your second part of the book is useless because it says your story, not the story of the minor and Crete that you're trying to say. Uh, so I have this feeling, and there's not just Ruth, is uh, I received a a reviewer's uh, comment back once in one of my funding applications that these kind of approaches are dedicated to fail. And that was on the review report. And of course, I didn't get the funding. Um, <laughs> so I feel that Wittgenstein is going and hand archaeology that there are some things that we can't speak about and we must <coughs> remain silent. But um, I would like to say something because I'm I, it's like I'm feeling oppressed and oppressed. So I would like to say something. I would like to say that, wait a minute, psychology and cognitive psychology, neuroscience actually, um, it tells us that, you know guys, if we can't get your emotions and senses, then we can explain your actions. And we are pretty confident that we can do that. Even if the critique on these approaches is that they are weird, they are very focused on white, middle-aged, whatever, whatever, black, uh, populations, and they're not universal. So keep that in mind, but that's another discussion and can't be happening in 10 minutes. But we have this. We have these people saying that. Um, so I'm coming over and say, can we find a geeky way to reconstruct the paleosensorial spectrum on the same way that we do paleoenvironmental reconstruction, let's say? Uh, so I picked some caves to 
trying to do this. Uh, why caves? Because caves, uh, occasionally, not every single cavity on Earth, but occasionally they have these three nice microenvironmental zones. And each of these zones has some certain characteristics. So people used to go into the caves and do stuff both in the entrance zone and the twilight zone and in the dark zone. And we can trace these activities. Uh, and my perception is if we know the microenvironment of the zone and the sensorial spectrum, the current sensorial spectrum of the zone, and because geologically we can learn how this spectrum might used to be three or four, five thousand years ago, can we correlate activities with microenvironment and senses and actually reconstruct why, when the narrative, so when the people are doing something in this entrance zone, how they were feeling, what they were sensing. Uh, so we, as every single archaeologist in this planet is doing, we built up a project and of course we have a website and you can go and check what we're doing. Uh, the, in the real terms, um, we made a database really with lots of caves from the Balkans and we went in sample of this cave and uh, caves and did some sensorial uh, recording in all these three zones and then we decide to excavate two sites. So the only thing that is published from this project at the moment is the methodology. And we, we have a particular way of mapping caves, which is Hibbs Disto X paperless mapping methodology. Um, and we use a specialized caving software called Therion to analyze everything. And then discussion starts, what's the best software to analyze the data is R, SPSS, TAS, and then Spatial analysis, is the GIS the end of the world? Mm. And, but we are very confident that if you like to have nice maps, use Illustrator at the end. So uh, that's a sample of our list of caves, and that's the map where our caves are spreading. Um, with, it's not a random selection. Uh, even if um, it's the part of the world with the best lager, uh, and that was a very, very important factor for us, uh, these mountains here, the Dynaric Alps and Pindus Mountains, this massive range, is a very nice area for research because it's a, it's a boundary, it's a border between these, between many worlds, really. So it's interesting to see uh, geographical patterns. Just a sample how, I mean, the simplified data set looks like. We have cave, elevation of the entrance, <coughs> orientation of the entrance, microenvironmental zones that they are in use, light, twilight, and dark. And then we have the disputed cave use thing, I mean, is what the excavator believe about how the cave was used in the Neolithic. Um, some people believe that their caves was a cult place, uh, like a sanctum. Other people believe that they were agro uh, caves for agro-pastoral activities. Uh, so we did some statistics. Uh, we checked uh, orientation and use, this proposed use. Envi microenvironment and propose used, and we did a Cohen Mandel Hazen's test in R to see all together. And apparently, even if these uses are disputed, it seems to be to have clusters of uses in certain microenvironments, which is interesting. Um, we went a step further and we map. So we map these areas. We get the temp many temperature samples, <coughs> humidity layers. Uh, sorry, humidity samples, luminance, auditory spectrums. We did some um, uh, PCA statistics, and of course we interpolate this stuff. And at the very end, we end up with these nice little maps. Illustrator makes miracles. And what you can see is they, in, the, in some cases, like in Leondari in, in Attica, uh, the area that has been heavily used in the Neolithic was the dark part of the cave, when, let's say, in... Kitsos, in Attica again, the activities were clustered in the twilight zone of the cave. Few conclusions about this thing. Um, now, after this research, we, are can, we are can be confident that in Middle and Late Neolithic Western Balkans, more activities in the caves, the majority of the activities, were clustered in the twilight zone, comparison, in comparison with light and dark zones. Then, if we see these activities, if we read through the excavator's reports or in the two caves that we excavated and we have some hard data, 
we could see that the activities that they actually clustered in the twilight zones are activities that are correlated with food production, animal heading, we have layers of dunk, uh, tool making, lots of flakes, they are clustered in this area. Uh, and then we can further endeavor, and this is where we're working now, to link all these activities uh, with certain senses. So, for example, did, uh, in, the in the light zone, you are very exposed to the elements. You are a little bit sheltered, but you can feel the cold or the heat or, I don't know, the spray from the rain. When in the dark part of the cave, you, may, you are in the absolute darkness, which is very damp and very cold occasionally, so you might be, feel a little bit terrified. So did they select where they're going to host their activities based on the sensorial spectrum? It seems that they did, but it's open to discussion. Uh, if you'd like to read a little bit more, go to our website. At the moment, it's a, little, it's a dull place with lots of caves and lots of information. We aim to tidy it up a little bit. Um, you can read the methodological paper about cave mapping, uh, which is online out there in the Just Reports. Or you can follow <coughs> me on Twitter. All the research updates goes there. Thank you very much.